Okay, well, I guess that's it. Um, we've been listening for a long time, and I'm used to, uh, usually I do workshops rather than talk at people. Um, but I was told to talk at people, so I hope I can keep you awake. <laughs> um, it's getting to be late in the afternoon. I'm, building, I'm also building on things that other people have said, and like Liz, I'm going to be sharing some personal stories and hoping that we can together draw some meaning out of them. So, following a dream, the power of passions, passion, persistence, and interdisciplinarity. Passion. I came by my passion for the arts naturally. My mother was a singer. My dad wrote fiction. I performed in my first show at eight years old. But when it came to a career, my parents did not want me to go into theater. They said, you'll never make a living. Um, my college friends tried to talk me out of theater, too, because it was the 60s, and everybody, you know, we wanted, all wanted to change the world, and my friend said, well, theater isn't political enough or spiritual enough to change the world, so don't do that. But I was passionate about changing the world, but I was also passionate about theater, and I was very stubborn. So I passionately believed that theater could make a difference in the world, and I vowed to dedicate my life to proving it. I ran into lots of obstacles, though. Most people, especially university administrators who control the purse strings, didn't think that theater was very important. And then came a turning point. In 1980, I directed Arthur Miller's The Crucible at Creighton University in Omaha. Now, I don't know if you know the play, but Miller used the Salem witch hunts as an analogy for the 1950s Red Scare McCarthyism witch hunts. Um, and the play is really a, a psychosocial investigation into human evil. As Miller's protagonist says, now hell and heaven grapple on our backs, and all our old pretense is ripped away. We are what we always were, but naked now. In order to play this script truthfully, I told my cast, it was our task to investigate the crisis conditions, which stripped the characters naked to discover why neighbor would kill neighbor in murderous fury. I chose as the spine for my interpretation, I won't explain to you about a spine, but it's uh, an infinitive verb, kind of the, the core of things. Anyway, my spine was to face the evil in oneself, since the good characters in the play were the ones who did face themselves and the bad ones were the ones who um, you know, projected their own demons on others and made them scapegoats. In his introduction to the play, Miller describes how in the McCarthy era, quote, a political, objective, knowledgeable campaign from the far right was capable of creating terror and manipulating the hysteria to its own ends. Having taught to do improvisations in rehearsal, I put together a heady witch's brew, including a Stanislavski exercise in which actors um, look into themselves to find analogies for their character's behavior. With our own hearts and minds and bodies, the cast and I experienced Miller's transformative crucible of terror, in which, like the play's protagonist, we struggled to face the evil in ourselves and rediscover our integrity. The exercises were incredibly effective in stimulating our creativity. Powerful crucible cast spell on Creighton Crowd, read the headlines in the Omaha World Herald. New ideas kept springing into my mind all the time, even after the production opened. I really realized the power of theater as active learning, where you learn by doing and then reflecting on what you've done. So though I'd proved to myself that theater is experiential applied research into what it means to be a human being, which is something I'd always believed but never fully experienced before, I hadn't yet achieved my goal of proving to the world that theater could be transformative. I needed to learn more. Interdisciplinarity. Having discovered that theater techniques for accessing creativity actually work, my next step was to apply for a Kellogg National Fellowship. This program for leadership training and interdisciplinary research had a vision that as society becomes more narrowly specialized, it needs leaders who can see the big picture and communicate across disciplinary boundaries. Forty fellows met twice a year for three years to examine broad issues, and each fellow also did individual research, taking him or her outside of the primary discipline. 
This encounter with interdisciplinarity also introduced me to interdisciplinary bias and stereotyping. At my interview, a formidable ge general challenged me saying, are you sure you're not just a frustrated actress? After being selected, I was told, you know, when we were planning this program, it never occurred to us that a theater person could have something to contribute. I gradually discovered, however, that fellows in other fields also were sensitive about stereotyping. The doctors felt hurt by doctor jokes, the lawyers didn't like the, the lawyer cliches, the sharks and all that, and so on. My proposal to research how creativity could be stimulated by theater was not something that they wanted me to do. They wanted me to go further outside my, my primary discipline. So I studied psychodrama and sociodrama, and eventually, working with my campus alcohol awareness director, I did interactive theater on drinking problems on campus. I began collaborating with a Kellogg Fellow in education. We did faculty development, and we also co-authored a book called Teaching and Performing, Ideas for Energizing Your Classes. Persistence. In 1989, I moved to MU where I uh, continued doing traditional theater, but also exploring theater as pedagogy, experiential pedagogy for other disciplines. In pursuit of the latter, I learned a qualitative research method from a colleague in counseling psychology, and together we did a grounded theory study of the impact of acting on actors, which nobody had really ever done before, interestingly enough, weird. In the mid-90s, I met um, Brazilian Augusto Boal. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was the founder of Theater of the Oppressed, building off of Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And uh, Theater of the Oppressed is an approach to social justice theater similar to sociodrama. In 2000, I brought Boal to MU for a lecture series where his work sparked interdisciplinary interest. Colleagues from education teamed up with me to research using TO techniques for diversity education. In 2003, we founded the Mizu Interactive Theater Troupe, also known as ITT. An ITT performance includes the following. Number one, a short research-based play which demonstrates a complex human problem with no single solution. Number two, Next, the actors stay in character to answer audience questions and thus provide further information into the problem. Three, then audience members are invited one by one to come up on stage, replace one of the characters, and try out their own solution to the problem. And then we talk about the solution. ITT is an active, experiential learning method. ITT played an, uh, a key role in two interdisciplinary MU grants, a Ford Foundation Difficult Dialogues grant, and after the grant was over, the MU Chancellor's Diversity Initiative continued to fund the performances. And the second one was an NSF advance grant for the advancement of women in the, in the sciences, in the STEM fields. Um, we also did some other projects, um, Mizzou ITT and the MU Med School uh, got a Komen grant to create performances to improve doctor-patient communication about breast cancer. Uh, and then we got an additional grant from Mizzou Advantage, which hopefully you'll ask more about, because um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but it is a program at MU which does fund interdisciplinary research um, on sp specific in specific areas that are selected as kind of niche areas. And, we were working on the niche area called One Health. So, I'm going to show you a very brief video clip. Um, if you know anything about live theater, you know that video flattens out live theater performances terribly, but this is just a two minute promotional video which will give you some sense of what ITT might possibly be like. If we, if we can get this to play, can you turn on the video for me please? Well, your mastectomy It's the news no woman ever wants to hear. You have invasive breast cancer. While these people are acting, the news is real for many women. One out of eight women in the United States is diagnosed with breast cancer. 
chemotherapy, is that where you lose your hair? These actors are in a play called The Breast Cancer Dialogue. Are you still sore? The University of Missouri play is designed to encourage young doctors and nurses to be more compassionate toward patients. When uh, students are first learning out as future physicians, they learn that it's important to establish a relationship and rapport with their patient and to be able to communicate effectively. MU Extension, the theater department, and the School of Medicine are collaborating to bring the breast cancer dialogues to rural communities across the state. And if something else is there, what does that mean? These scenes are based on real conversations between doctors and patients. The MU Extension Community Arts Specialist says the Breast Cancer Dialogues is a creative way to help healthcare professionals and breast cancer survivors better communicate with one another. Breast cancer affects everyone, family members, co-workers, and the arts are one way to really find an understanding to the complexity of the disease. Where are you going? I have to go to work. Well, I wasn't out eating tea and crumpets. It's interactive theater, so the audience can participate. It can be a great learning experience for medical and nursing students and those affected by breast cancer. Your chances of survival are much better than they would have been 20 years ago. Why, back then, you'd have been a goner. That's one of the things we do with interactive theaters. When they see something they don't like, they yell, stop. And we stop the scene, and then they can intervene. And that is where we get the most feedback from audiences of saying, no, that can't happen. I won't let this happen to this patient. In the end, helping doctors help breast cancer patients better deal with their disease. From the University of Missouri, I'm Kent Faddis reporting. So now you've seen a little clip of ITT. But in 2009, my persistence paid off. I ran across sources such as Dan Pink's Why Right Brainers Will Rule the World, which suggested that the time had finally come to pursue my dream of using theater to enhance creativity. And by the way, I'm assuming that if you're at this conference, you have seen um, Sir Ken Robinson's 2006 TED Talks in which he talks about how our school system really tends to kill creativity, to crush it, and that many people who could be creative and were creative have been taught that they're not creative. And so if you want to teach people you know, to be creative, you first have to address that. So I suggested to the ANS dean that um, MU develop an interdisciplinary minor in creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Excited, he gave me his blessing. Talking with interested faculty, I discovered another group had been exploring a similar project on the other side of campus. But what the other group didn't know was how to teach creativity. It didn't occur to them to consult the arts. They were looking through the course catalog for courses with the word creativity in the title. In 2010, 2011, I got a leave to develop a course in creativity for the non-arts major. And by the way, like Liz, I do not think that creativity is only in the arts, but I dislike it when people tell me that artists aren't creative, which is something I've heard, unfortunately, all too often. Anyway, I apprenticed with three faculty teaching creativity classes elsewhere, a performance artist at Wake Forest, an engineer at the University of Illinois, and an educational psychologist at Oklahoma State. The creativity course I developed garnered such positive student response that the director of the Honors College asked me to develop a one-credit version for incoming honors freshmen. I've been researching student learning in the class, and this fall I'm collaborating with bioengineering faculty to teach creativity to their capstone students. In spring 2015, we founded the MU Center for Applied Theater and Drama Research, which houses ITT, the Creativity Initiative, our work with scientists and science communication, teaching the scientists how to communicate with the lay public, and some new research using neurofeedback. My interdisciplinary project experiences confirmed what I'd learned as a Kellogg Fellow. One major challenge is teaching others how things work in your own field. For instance, I needed to explain that no, we couldn't cut a character from the script because that would destroy the play's structure. Even more important, though, is establishing mutual trust. A female scientist on the NSF project confided after some contentious struggles 
that she had been taught as a graduate student, only bench scientists deserve respect. Of course, bias can go in the other direction. A businessman once told me he hates artists because they ask him for money, but they look down their nose at him. I'm creative too, he complained. I created my own business. In Ungifted, Intelligence Redefined, cognitive psychologist Scott Barry Kaufman reviews studies of eminent creators and concludes that, quote, drive, persistence, and love for the domain are the only things distinguishing the highest creative achievers from everyone else. In other words, the idea that, oh, you have to be born with it or you can't be creative isn't true. On the path to interdisciplinary collaboration, I've discovered that respect for other people's passions also lights the way. Thank you. Now, I can either answer questions or I can do a quick um, exercise with you. Which would you like? Exercise. Exercise, okay. Glad. Great. You don't have to get up. You don't have to move around. What you have to do is make sure you don't hit the person sitting next to you. You raise your right arm, you put out a finger, and you draw a circle in the air. See? This is very easy. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be all that creative to do that. Okay, great. Now, the other arm, other finger, make a plus sign. Wonderful. We've got lots of creative people here. Good. Now, do both at the same time, please. How's it going? Can anybody do it? Can anybody do it? Why is this difficult? Anybody? Why is this difficult? Any thoughts? Well, I tell you, I have done this exercise with lots of different groups all over the country. And I get all sorts of answers. Oh, right brain, left brain, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, can't walk and chew gum at the same time, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I tell you, there is one group of people that I have found that often can do this exercise pretty well, pretty quickly. Musicians. Think about it. Musicians do different things with their hands at the same time. Now, if you know musicians, how often do musicians practice? Lots, right? They practice a lot. So this leads us to believe that if we had believed, if someone had told us when we were little kids, if you can't do you know, this thing, um, nobody's going to love you and you'll never make a living and so on, we would have practiced like crazy and we'd be able to do it. Well, it's kind of like the same thing with creativity. If we really, really wanted to do it and if we thought it was important and if we practiced, we could do it. And we'd get better and better and better as we kept practicing. Like other things, it's a muscle. Thank you. <laughs>